Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Valentina Muso. I am a lecturer in political economy at University College London, which is based uh, in the UK. And uh, the titles of today's talk is uh, Navigating the Future, Strategic Foresight, Building uh, Strategic Preparedness for an Evolving uh, World. Now, when we think about uh, strategic foresight, we think about an approach that allows us to systematically think about the future and detect possible future trends, which implies also understanding the challenges and the opportunities that come with the future and also technological advancement. Now, of course, this systematic approach is not uh, uh, something easy to develop and uh, um, to develop. And uh, so today we're going to discuss uh, all those themes and all uh, um, and strategic foresight uh, with uh, an expert, uh, Liv Van Holsen, who is uh, a leading expert uh, in strategic foresight. She has more than 30 years of experience uh, in the field. She was uh, the former head of the strategic foresight service for the European Parliament Research Service, which we know is the in-house think tank for the European Parliament. After the talk, there will be the possibility to ask uh, uh, questions. So uh, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Liv to start the talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Valentina. I'm going to start the PowerPoint. Well, um, so welcome all. I didn't expect so many external people. I'm very happy to see you all. Um, Valentina just said that I was head of service of the strategic foresight service. This was the scientific foresight service, but afterwards my last function at the European Parliament was senior foresight advisor at the strategic foresight service. So it's all um, more or less in the same area. Um, so I will tell you a bit about um, foresight, but I will focus on foresight methods. And first, I'd like to invite you just to have a look to this image. We come back to it in 45 minutes or so. Um, but how this situation could happen. Just keep it in mind. Don't talk with each other about it, because then you will miss everything. Okay. There we go. So uh, what I will tell you today is I will speak about, I will focus on governance for technology. And um, after an introduction, I will uh, give some possible pitfalls in technology policy making. And then I will focus on foresight based thinking. It's a good uh, occasion to give really a kind of um, crash course in foresight thinking which is about, um, so I will speak about collecting information about the future, how you do this, and about foresight thinking habits. And these are five of these, um, and we will go through the five. And then I will come uh, to conclusions with a call for action. So, let's go. Um, what you see here, yeah, you may be a bit interactive, we are not too many. Drone delivery. This is uh, basically uh, based on an example from 2012. Um, I will come to this in the next slide. But drones can not only be used for delivering pizzas, but also for humanitarian aid. And then I would like to, to hear from you what you think that the third drone is doing. monitoring for agriculture, but at the time that I used this first in a slide, there was um, uh, an item on the news in Flanders that police was using such a drone for controlling uh, fruit pickers which worked undeclared. So there was already a variety of applications. And this is exactly what I want to point out. When we speak about governance of technology, uh, we have to be aware that there are a lot of applications possible from one single technology. If we look about the drones, so I go back to uh, 2012, there were a lot of worries. So about safety, for instance, risks of collisions or a drone that falls down, a drone of 25 kilo, if it falls on your head from 20 meters, um, 
you will not sell it afterwards. Um, privacy, because there are drones with cameras. Most of the drones have cameras if they are used for uh, controlling things and so on. Uh, security issues, dual use, illegal activities, um, and airspace managers. So a lot of worries. So um, there was a lot of work for governance to make policies to tackle all these worries. And this was also done in the time at the European Parliament. This was why I took this as an example. So there was regulation to address the concerns, to address the safety concerns, privacy concerns, security concerns, and airspace management. So this is a case which was quite well under control um, for addressing the concerns. So, Everything today, and for those uh, who are here for the workshop tomorrow, is about responsible policy making for the future in a technology-driven society. And basically the key thing is that we need to have the right balance between benefits and harms of a technology in the um, um, regulation. So the uh, striking the right balance is really crucial in uh, shaping the responsibility and sustainable future-proof regulation. And then there are uh, some challenges, like uh, for governance in a technology-driven society as ours today, is how do we shape innovations to align with our values and um, principles in society? How can we ensure that our governance system adapt, evolve, and remain inclusive in the face of rapid change, because everything changes while we are working at um, legislation. And what future trajectories must European Union embark upon uh, to navigate this challenge? Uh, this we will not all discuss, I mean, I'm not an expert in all of these, just in foresight methods, but foresight-based policy making. So the, the foresight habits, which I will explain to you, definitely will be a very good guide and help um, to um, have um, a good governance on technology. And then, um, to end the, um, the introduction, I will also speak about, I will just list you possible pitfalls in technology policy making. First of all, there is a lack of um, technical understanding, especially because everything also changes very quickly. So, if for making policy, you also need to understand what the technology is, what it can do, how it can change, and so on. Um, what's a pitfall which can be very easy to overcome is lack of multidisciplinary approaches. If you approach a technology from all, uh, from all type disciplines, um, for instance here at the University of Amsterdam, if you take a sociological point and psychological and historical economic, you already have a lot of ways to think about, for instance, drones. So multidisciplinary um, approaches are very important. Um, of course, there are also um, lobbying, in special interest, and misinformation, which also can be dangerous um, because they can completely put you on the wrong leg about technologies. And then um, what's also a possible pitfall is if you do not engage sufficiently with public, with stakeholders, uh, that you don't take into account unintended consequences because you have to think about this, you have to um, investigate this, and that you, uh, another pitfall is that you don't think too far. So foresight thinking can be a very good help to avoid all these uh, pitfalls. Um, and what I will explain in the rest of the talk is that um, force is this sounding well because here it hampers a bit, but I don't know. It's okay. Okay. Um, so foresight-based means first going beyond the traditional evidence. It means taking a systems approach to kind of systems analysis for every technology you work with for the future, uh, looking from 360 degrees. 
uh, being aware of biases, checking assumptions and considering possible bias. So this is what we are going to treat next. And what foresight is not, it's not about predicting the future. So it's about minimizing surprise, it's about being prepared for what might happen, even if it will not happen. And um, it is also for preventing that you make policies, um, that you create policies which have unwanted effects um, on society or on other policies. Um, so we are halfway of uh, the content slide. I will tell about uh, collecting information about the future. So, how you can include information about the future? What you know today is here till the middle. Today, everything from the past is sure, it's published, it's peer reviewed. But after today, you only can know a bit uh, based upon models. And models are only reliable for a short term after today. Um, and if they are not about complex things. So you can have, um, if you have models even about population growth, the UN makes models which are um, having a very big um, uh, differentiation in the far future. But other organizations, they work on these models and they also take into account other factors like, for instance, a possible change in fertility rate. And then you have completely um, then you have a very big difference between what uh, different scenarios of what can happen. So we know everything from the past. We know what are things today. But for the future, we can know about, we would like to know about societal context. If we speak about the future, um, you have to have a feeling and some information about how this happens. Are there social scientists here? Ah, voilà. So if we get questions about this, I send them all to you. So societal context, how, the, how we uh, try to balance um, evidence and societal context is if we only take the evidence, you can simply listen to engineers and so on, and they will know what's the best. Like on drones, that's quite easy. But if you only think about societal evidence, what people uh, would like to have, and so on, and you do not take into account any of the evidence, then you have a kind of um, context-based policy which is more like um, populism. And what we do with foresight is balancing them. Balance what we know today with the societal context and the societal context, and I think it's here, no, the societal context comes from uh, people. So this is qualitative information. And uh, till today you have quantitative information, which you know, which is peer-reviewed. Qualitative information, it's concerns, it's hopes and fears from people from which you can have an idea about extreme futures, extreme things that can happen in the future. Um, so, then the real foresight habits in thinking. Um, I list five. Um, seeing the bigger picture. Um, is the first one, taking a 360 degree view, the bias awareness, I already mentioned them earlier. Uh, be sure that you check all key assumptions and um, exploring possible impacts of technologies, but also possible impacts of policies you consider um, to advise. So, anyone knows about systems analysis here? You, you all read Luhmann? <laughs> well, then you know much more than I. It was a, a, a very difficult book for me to read. But um, systems analysis is very interesting to understand the full system about policy. So what we do in a, systems, in a simple systems analysis like in Foresight is to try to understand the ecosystem that we have to take into account for the technology for the, um, related to the policy uh, we have to uh, develop for the technology. And this is basically first the scope of the topic, like we spoke about drones, but you already see immediately that it's more than just a delivery drone, so you have really to see what do you want to focus on, um, and then who are all the actors and stakeholders. And then how 
um, you can make a systems analysis in foresight. It's much more simple than what Lumen wrote. It's uh, something you can easily do with a few people. So um, what we used to do at European Parliament, we call a few colleagues together and also some trainees like over lunch and so on. We had an interesting discussion of one hour about a topic um, which all started with open questions because everything people say in their concerns, so if you remember the yellow bucket, everything that people say they hope or fear is uh, something you have to take into account because nothing of that is true or false. If people feel something, if they are afraid of something, this is something which is important for policymakers to take into account, to know. And questions, open questions start with uh, words like who, what, where, why, when and how. Um, an easy mnemonic is five whiskies and the hangover, but uh, don't do this at home, I think. Um, so, but with just a round of open questions, you really can put a lot of keywords and this, this help you really to outline, to draw an ecosystem of an issue. <coughs> ah, yeah. I have a uh, case here of electrification of cars. Um, what do you think about when you think about electrification of the car park? Just some words. Infrastructure. Infrastructure. Infrastructure for what? Yeah, I think they are they are um, discussing this at this moment in Strasbourg. <laughs> Other elements. So that's also related to the infrastructure and. Yes. Other elements. Yes, if they burn, the only thing you can do is drop the car in a big container with water and uh, wait until it stops. So, we have the charging, but your electricity, everything is done, all the electrification of cars is part of a plan for combating climate change. But where does the electricity come from? We have to be aware that electricity also should be green. Um, how are we going to make the batteries? So there are, um, the battery industry is mainly monopolized by China, but the minerals, uh, most of the minerals come from conflict areas in Congo. And if we see the, um, the working circumstances of people working in the mines and living around the mines, um, there is also a big environmental problem. So we already are far away from the use of the car here. We are um, thinking about ethical issues related to the mining. Um, this is an article from a while ago about um, China trying to get hold about a lot of, of these mines on cobalt. Um, it's from a while ago, I think now it's even um, worse. Plus, what do we do with the old cars? So we say we cannot have them in Europe, so we export them to places where then they have the pollution that we don't want to have. And then it was already mentioned, the infrastructure, which is now a hot item in press because a lot of people travel through Europe, through France, to France to, or to France, and they don't find uh, fast charging uh, systems. So it's a quite complex problem. But then there is one other thing. Um, Euroactive um, several times published articles with quotes from people uh, working on the Green Deal, and they say, yes, one of our purposes is that all families in Europe should be able uh, to travel without worrying about charging their cars. But do we all need cars in cities like Amsterdam, like Brussels, like London, like Paris? So there are a lot of assumptions. It's like if we need to have uh, cars, so it's also a question of urbanization. So this just to, to show that um, how a systems analysis can done in a simple logical 
discussion where you let everyone talk and build on, on each other around open questions. So the, the five whiskies and the hangover come here. So all these open questions really lead to a very rich map of what uh, could be taken into account. If we then think about stakeholders analysis, because stakeholders are important to be heard um, for people uh, making policy analysis for policy advice. And uh, the policy ecosystem, uh, whatever topic it is, there are always politicians or other policy makers. There are always advisors. There is the scientific and academic community. Uh, the think tank community. Uh, think tank community is a very interesting thing. How many of you are uh, coming from a university? Yeah, that's like almost everyone. Is there anyone working at the think tank? <laughs> you used to work in a think tank. So the difference between a think tank and an academic community. An academic community, you write a lot of papers. And these papers are very interesting for people who are working in the same area. Um, a think tank works on the same topics, but they publish, uh, most of the top think tanks publish very interesting papers which are readable by everyone without a technical background. And this makes that there is a difference. When you use information coming from a think tank, um, it can help you a lot to understand an issue. However, a think tank can be linked to a certain point of view. So you have just to keep this in the back of your head that it's maybe not neutral. But it's very interesting information and it's another type of information than what you get from scientific and academic literature. And then all types of societal stakeholders, including industry, uh, special interest and pressure groups, um, NGOs and so on. Uh, plus, then you have also influences of everyone. Yes, they are listed here as um, policy ecosystem. They are not a real stakeholder, but everyone is influenced by environment and then media and social media. So everyone influences the ecosystem. Um, for stakeholders analysis to really identify who could be important to consult or to hear um, on a topic such as case of electrification, of course, it depends on what is the real issue, what is the purpose of the policy analysis, who is involved, and what assumptions are made. And then for uh, the slides that you just have seen, I can list the car industry, electricity, uh, production sector, batteries, uh, mining industry, um, the people who will drive the cars, the consumer organization, ecologist, recycling industry, all types of NGOs. This can be environmental NGOs, but also development NGOs, if you have uh, seen the image of the mines in Congo, um, policy makers, but also urban planners. So it helps to do this systems investigation to understand who can have something which is relevant to say, to consider for policy makers. Um, so that's quite important to do for every topic. You want to ask something? Yeah. Yes, there of course, yes. Yeah, everything you can add, you can add, and then it's a question of balancing uh, who you involve. Thank you, I've forgotten on this slide. Um, so this was for the ecosystem, and the second one was on a 360 degree view. Um, this is a very important foresight habit and oops, um, to be sure that your systems analysis, that you, your analysis of the stakeholder, of the ecosystem, it doesn't have too many blind spots. It's always good to do the, the same exercise in another way, and that's investigating from, yeah, we use here seven different lenses. Uh, a lot of people know steep or not, or pest or pestle. I see some, yeah. So we used, uh, we developed this along steeped um, because uh, when we um, used, oops, yes, I'm not used to this computer and there are things I will show there. So um, 
We added ethical and demographic when we have discussed this with the STOA panel at European Parliament, which is a scientific advisory body. And they thought that ethical and demographic could be added to be sure that they were not forgotten. Of course, if you go through this steep wheel, most of ethical issues and demographic issues are already covered by the rest, but it's good to mention them um, specifically. But it's not every piece of the pie is relevant for every topic, but it helps, it's a kind of checklist. And what we did, um, and we use this for workshops, and those who want to have a high resolution PDF of this wheel, uh, you can send me a message. I forgot to drop my email on this, but I will give it to the organizers. Um, where we developed several um, sub-questions. For instance, when you see there environmental, which is one of the several lenses, we have um, questions about product safety, but also about production safety, about uh, recyclability, about water and energy efficiency, um, about natural resource uses, and about environmental impact. So just to, to be sure that, that there are a lot of elements covered by um, going through this wheel. Um, for instance, we have used this uh, for <coughs> A foresight paper, yeah, we used to write a lot of uh, two pages, and one was on artificial meat. Um, what if we didn't need cows for our beef? It's just uh, an assumption. What, what if we um, have a lot of artificial meat almost as default meat? Um, if we go through this wheel, so this uh, was a paper which, I, uh, which was written with a trainee who was a biotechnologist and a vegan. So it was a very interesting topic. Um, and if we use this wheel, just I will scan with some examples what comes up if you do such an exercise. First of all, is it vegan when you have artificial meat? Um, there are a lot of technologies involved because if everyone would would always buy artificial meat. You also, for instance, need um, an incubator in every kitchen next to the microwave. Um, the, the environmental um, issue of agriculture will completely be different. Um, the common agriculture policy will change. I mean, there is a lot done about um, environmental sustainability. Um, which has a completely other context with artificial meat. What do you meet with meat at the butchers? Can you put it in the, on the counter, surrounded by the rest of meat, or do we need special legislation? Uh, the last one here and um, down is uh, from an article in BBC when um, chicken, which was not containing real meat, was uh, exported to UK. How did I have to treat it? It was not meat, so was there special legislation needed? Um, animal welfare, maybe vegans can eat meat if it's artificial, if it's culture, because the ethical issue of animal welfare is not there. So is this then more ethical? So there are a lot of issues which come up if you go through such a wheel. So this was the second of the five foresight habits. The next one is about awareness of biases. What do you see here? Which one is the biggest? Yeah, what our brains want to see is always a bit influenced by a lot of things. So if you would not have the lines in the backgrounds, they are all the same size. So our brain can see what it wants to see. And this is identified by the first thing you focus on. So it's just an illustration uh, that we don't see all the same thing or always the exact right thing. Um, when you... Um, 
speak about biases is basically a systematic difference, a systematic distortion of what we see. And uh, everyone is biased. So I had a, a neuroscientist, a young neuroscientist as a colleague in Brussels. And um, bi bias is something which comes in our brains from our first weeks. So this is something developed by the environment. But it makes a big difference in how we perceive evidence, how we react on opinions, and how we uh, make uh, assessments of evidence. And um, I've um, developed this, this wheel. Yes, um, it's always nice to work in wheels because people don't stop before they really have nothing to add anymore. So um, it's, um, I made a distinction between bias in research, for instance, due to a setup of um, a research project, and the biases in the perception of um, evidence. And the biases in the perception go from cultural biases, which can include, for instance, religious biases, attention biases, and therefore I have a specific example, interest bias, which can be conflict of interest, um, availability bias, um, but I think I can better do this in the, explain this in the next slide. Um, no, I, I come back on this immediately. Um, so, but understanding your own biases and thinking about how other people are, um, people from your stakeholder groups are biased can help you a lot to have an open mind, to be interested in how they explain that they see a thing different than you do. So this helps a lot to understand. Foresight is all about open mind. So you don't have um, a clear idea from, from the beginning. You listen with an open mind to what other people think. So the issues can be unbiased and value-free. What do you think? I see a lot of people nodding. So it's impossible as policy makers, it's impossible as policy advisors, as scientists, as citizens, if you see us as humans. However, when you are paid to, be, to write neutral policy analysis, for instance, then you have to be aware of all your biases and try to not take your biases in your research or your analysis. Um, and bias often is related to facts and beliefs which don't really fit. Um, I can explain this with an um, example of the confirmation bias. So we have our beliefs and we have, like, uh, coming back to one of the first slides, a bucket with facts and evidence. So all the books, papers and so on. Um, of course, there is an overlap of the evidence and what we believe. And the evidence we tend to believe is the one which fits with our beliefs. So the evidence which, which has no contradiction in what we want and what we believe is really um, what we like to believe. And evidence which is not supporting our statements, our beliefs, our worldview is in the first in, in the confirmation bias is the evidence we tend to ignore. Um, and basically all biases have a, sim a similar um, um, background as this. So for the biases, um, we also made this wheel and then I was at the moment of the availability bias can be, for instance, an authority say something. When Trump said that you could drink um, bleaching water uh, to, uh, not, for not being ill from COVID, several people did it because he's the president, he knows. So an authority, just because people see someone as an authority, can uh, say the most stupid things and these are believed to be true because it's an authority. Association bias is something which um, I think is one of the strongest biases. We very quickly, when we hear something, we judge if something is good or something is bad. Um, and I will give an example of a tunnel vision. So the tunnel vision is in the green part, is attention bias. If we, um, which, which example did I take? Yes, uh, the introduction of autonomous vehicles. So if you really are fond of autonomous vehicles and you think that this is really 
uh, a fantastic technology and you are asked to assess what you could know about um, autonomous vehicles, you look to positive things. For instance, yes, I have some blind friends, and I think this is really uh, something fun, that blind people can drive a car. So this is from um, a news article, Washington Post, um, a blind man who drove um, unaccompanied uh, throughout Texas. But if you focus on benefits, you focus on uh, reduced traffic congestion, on improved fuel efficiency, on increased mobility for individuals with disabilities. But what could happen? What with the harms? So you will neglect risks, you will neglect drawbacks, so cyber security um, issues, uh, job losses uh, of taxi drivers, of bus drivers, uh, truck drivers, and so on. So there are a lot of things which you overlook because you are focusing on all the benefits. And the consequences is, if you really focus only on the benefits, that your policies can be very one-sided and you are not prepared, um, for instance, for addressing the job losses of taxi drivers, bus drivers, and so on. Um, so this is a bit um, a tricky issue. And uh, therefore, it's important to always Foresight you never do alone. So if you do such an analysis, try to bring different people together with a different background or um, a different, different view. Uh, people from different ages have different reflections about new developments. And always think about harms and benefits. Always think about contradictory elements to be sure that you don't have um, gaps in your analysis. Um, I also would like to take the opportunity to focus on some mistakes which, are, which happen a lot when assessing evidence. What do you see here? Very, very quick gut reaction. Um, a huge price increase. What's the baseline? What's the baseline, indeed? So, this, this type of graphs appear a lot in press. Um, yeah, I, st I had to stop complaining to, my, to one of my own newspapers because I systematically sent them. But anyway, they know. So basically, the baseline was like uh, 79. So uh, an increase from, from 80 to 82 is not a massive increase if you watch the second one with baseline zero. Uh, but this is something you have to be um, alert for. And another mistake which happens a lot is correlation versus causation. Correlation, things happen together. You have hot and dry and sunny summer weather. Um, you eat a lot of ice cream and um, you, are, you easily have sunburn. What causes what? I mean, this is a very simple example, but um, you can have uh, <laughs> a lot of issues like uh, with the COVID vaccinations and so on. Shall I give the solution on the screen? Voila, the ice cream eating does not cause a sunburn and so on. Here it's very clear, but it's important if there is a correlation to check, yes, but is this also a cause? So here it's clear that um, it's all from the hot weather. Then there is another interesting thing uh, related to biases, and that's nudging. I have an example from a Flemish newspaper about a nudging experience on malaria nets. Um, there are, um, yeah, we have in Flanders, where, I, where I'm from, we have uh, NGOs who work a lot with um, Central Africa, Congo, Burundi, Rwanda, and there is a lot of malaria there, and there are organizations spreading preventive material. And one of these most efficient ones is malaria net, mosquito nets, bed nets. Um, problem is, you can use bed nets for a lot of things. Can you imagine something? Fishing, wrapping, wedding dresses, chicken ranch, football goal, protecting, protecting plants. So the problem is they were immediately used for a lot of other uses. 
But then um, um, a guy said, yes, but we will put, because these countries happen also to be uh, very Catholic. Let us put a drawing of Jesus on the net and the mothers will take care of it. And this indeed happened. So what I did was, they put Jesus on the net to, ha to also give the sign, uh, the net will protect you. And um, the nets were better maintained and the mothers refused um, everyone in the family to use it for other things than for protecting them um, from malaria. So you can use you can make positive use of biases. Biases are not per se bad, and biases are normal, but you have to be aware, especially in your work, if you have a certain role, that you keep your private role as an activist or whatever separate from your work. It's not always easy, but it works. And then I have one more example on bias and perspective about... Um, because biases you can avoid a lot to really try to focus on an issue, uh, turn it around, look from all sides what it means, uh, upside down, backside, and so on. And one of the examples um, which is really about perspectives and biases is the way we, are, uh, t uh, we got uh, lessons about uh, geography. So a globe always has the pin through the North Pole, a map, that we used to work traditionally with in Europe has the North Pole top, but it's a very broad North Pole because it's the same size as the, as the rest of the map. So if you want to study the North Pole here, it's a bit tricky. And if you really look from the North Pole, and this is an old map, uh, which I found once in Paris, uh, a very old map from the North Pole. And then you get a completely different view, because here you see, so I don't know if you see it um, there, but in the middle you have the North Pole, but then you have the Americas, you have uh, Russia, you have Asia, you have Europe, everything is very nearby. So you get a completely, completely different view if you want to study the North Pole. So if you see that, you can think about what if the ice cap melts, about... Um, uh, deep sea mining for oil or for minerals, about defense, uh, about tourism, about transport. So it opens completely new worlds because, for instance, I never realized that you can um, have a, a very short flight from Asia to America if you just cross the North Pole. But these things, it's important to look to everything from all sides. So that's basically a visualization of what bias is. And therefore, we come at. Oops, um, I don't know what's going. Okay, at the next one, which is checking key assumptions. I will not go into a detail about what assumptions are, but I will give you an example. Um, an example for a key for an assumption which has. Um, strange consequences is the four pest campaign. Anyone knows here about the four pest campaign? Mao Zedong, now China experts here. You are. So, you know what this is? The bird? A sparrow. Uh, Mao said that he wanted to eradicate the four pests and these were What's more understandable than sparrows? Rats. Yes, we all want to get rid of rats. Mosquitoes, flies, and sparrows. And why the sparrows? Does anyone have an idea why he wanted to eradicate the sparrows? Why, why he saw them as a pest? They eat the grain. Yeah. They eat the grain, yeah. So he assumed that um, they consume seeds that otherwise could be uh, used for human consumption. And uh, he thought, yes, with a growing population in China, he wanted to have more food. But what do the sparrows eat? Insects. A field full of insects and no one to eat them. Because the, the sparrows were killed, he uh, gave a kind of social credit to every citizen who brought that sparrow. 
So people um, wanted to have a good reputation in the commune and they killed sparrows and they collected the dead sparrows and they brought them to the commune. So after a few years, all the sparrows were eradicated. And the consequence was that there was a big famine because there was a lot of misharvest. Um, 200 million Chinese died uh, from starvation. So this was a huge problem, a huge consequence from just one assumption which everyone accepted because Mao said that this was a pest and they should be eradicated and the result was that there was no food anymore. So what they did in the end was this happened uh, from 15, 1959 till um, 1961 or 62 and then they reintroduced sparrows uh, with the help of the USSR. And then the problem was uh, solved after a few years. But with one single key assumption which is a basic assumption which changes um, a lot in what you do, you can have um, a big impact. Um, so a key assumption checks, we gave uh, specific trainings for this at European Parliament to colleagues and to members, but um, basically you can also do this with a group of a few colleagues that you uh, put together over a coffee and you try to discuss about um, are there assumptions in a work I'm asked to do. And then uh, try to challenge the assumptions. For instance, um, if you would say, yes, if we have um, all cars um, electrified yes, um, by uh, 2030, or we, we need renewable, all electricity to be renewable by 2030, I just uh, say something, um, is this possible? or not? Is this überhaupt possible? Do we have, what, what do we need for it? Is there a reality check for the material we need and so on? So there can already, be, we can raise a lot of questions just by seeing is there something hidden which we just assume which might um, be not true. So, and the, the good way to do it is you just involve a skeptic or you ask someone to put a hat of uh, of a devil and play the devil's advocate. This helps a lot to, to reveal um, assumptions which are not true. So always seek for contradictory evidence and see what you know and what you do not know. And everything which you do not know, you fill it in. So then there is a problem. Um, but key assumption checks, it's always good to do this to be sure. Um, you can do this, for instance, but um, we will not have um, time to go into this. But uh, simple statements like e-scooters are environmentally friendly. This is something which is often taught by people using e-scooters. Um, by the way, are e-scooters forbidden in Amsterdam? But maybe pr only private ones. Because I, <laughs> in Brussels, you, are, you have to see where you, where you walk and so on, so they are very disciplined here. Ah, voilà. yeah. yeah, but there are, yeah, but yeah, there is anyway a big difference because a lot of people think that e scooters are environmentally friendly, but you, you have uh, the make of it, you have what you do with as a recycling system, how you charge them. Um, I once spoke to uh, job students early in the morning who picked up all the scooters which were left in the streets and they explained to me that they were going to charge them outside Brussels in, a, in an area where they used, um, yeah, we call it groups, so um, generators working on diesel. No, it's a bit... Uh, <laughs> Contradictory, so they were not always environmentally friendly. Then statements like the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. No natural scientist. That's true, yes. <laughs> so there are things which are clearly true, and there are things which are clearly untrue, and there are a lot of things which are a bit true. And then what's not true, you don't know, you have evidence that an e-scooter drives electric, but you don't have an evidence about the environmental friendliness, just as an example of assumption checks. So we are at the last uh, way of um, foresight thinking, and that's exploring possible impact. Um, 
There is a very useful technique, and it's very easy. The only thing you need is a big whiteboard or a big paper, and um, you draw a futures wheel. And a futures wheel, it has been developed by Jerome Glenn. I don't know if anyone heard about him. He's the CEO of the um, uh, Millennium Project. And he developed this futures wheel for his um, master thesis in 1971. And in the end, he published it in scientific papers in the 90s. And it's um, generally used uh, for uh, foresight. And he developed it as a visual tool to explore consequences of something which you really focus on. You put it in the middle and you look into what are first order impacts if this happened or if you use this and so on. And then second order, and you develop it, but you write it down. And if you write it down, you, you are confronted with it also when your work is done. If you don't write down um, what the ideas are, you just pick out a few which are the, the most obvious one and you work with this. But he says you write it down, you use this as a visual tool. Um, in the parliament we use it not only for exploring impacts of a technology, but we also do the same with policy options. Or if something can happen, we also look into um, how you can mitigate something. So you see what's a possible consequence, but you also see what you can do to avoid this consequence. So you can use it for policy actions in the end also, not only for the cause of the uh, things caused by technology. So for instance, to come back on this uh, paper on what if we didn't need cows for our beef, what do you think happens when you don't have beefs anymore, when you don't have cows anymore for your meat? Things that come up, just keywords. Extinction of cows. <laughs> hmm? Not in Italy for the milk. Yes. Uh, every time I have Italians in the room, <laughs> they speak about cheese. The farmers. What do you do with the farmers? What do you do with agricultural land used for cows? But for the milk. If you don't have cows, you don't have milk and the price can skyrocket. So there are, if you look then in steeped, you look into economic consequences. So you can use all these tools so far, also for analyzing such, such an issue. Um, Sorry, there's also, for instance, some cultures like the Uyghur and Sudan are centered around cattle, so that would also have massive cultural uh, impact. So. Yes. So there are, this is an hypothetical issue, but it's always good when you do foresight to think in extreme futures and then to see what happens if you, for instance, try to make all your meat without cows. You also don't have leather. Will you substitute the leather by plastics? Then you have other problems and so on. So uh, it helps a lot to, to elaborate a topic. So it's the future wheel. And then there are many types of impacts. Everyone knows intended versus unintended. We also have desirable and undesirable, avoidable and unavoidable. That's another thing. And hard versus soft. Um, I will come on all of them. So first of all, there is a kind of, yeah, a lot of people refer to the law of unintended consequences. And uh, basically what I mean is um, that there are always outcomes possible of an action you take which you did not intend to have. Um, for instance, when, the, when Ford uh, developed the first course, the impact of introduction of course. Can you think about impacts which were... No horses. No horses. Ah, yes, this I didn't think about. Yes, rubber got really expensive. Danger. Danger. Changes in city infrastructure. Yes. So, impact on urban planning. Uh, I mean, in the Netherlands, uh, yes, you are in the Netherlands very well disciplined, but in Belgium, in Flanders, uh, the 
urban planning became a real disaster after the car, I think. Uh, because if you have cars, you, can, you don't have to live in urban areas, so you can build wherever. Environmental consequences like um, pollution and so on. Social and cultural changes, because you can go everywhere, so you also do this. Economic shifts uh, like um, public transport, but also whole society changes. If you think away the car, of course, in Amsterdam, you still have bikes. Um, but the way we live changed completely. So just the impact of a new invention, the car. Um, an example of an undesirable consequence of social media is, for instance, fake news and misinformation. Um, it can be responsible for polarization and divisiveness. Um, you can get the slides if you want. <laughs> yeah, I should have told this an hour ago. Um, undermining democratic process. So in election years, it can be a big uh, disaster. And if wrong information is spread about um, certain um, industrial issues and so on, it can have an enormous economic impact. And a very dangerous impact is when it's about, when there is fake news about, which is um, related to health, to medication, to treatments, and so on. So uh, that's about undesirable consequences, but undesirable um, for the one uh, can be desirable for another. Uh, I, can, I can come back on the artificial meat. Um, green politicians can say, yes, I want everything. I want the meat industry um, to stop because it's bad for the environment, but a politician representing a big community of um, of uh, meat industry, of cows breeding and so on, can say yes, but for me it's, it's not good because anyway we still stay, we always will stay a niche of good meat and so on. So desirable for the one is not per se desirable for the other. Um, and then there are also things you can, uh, impacts you can avoid if you think things really through when you introduce them. I remember when we had the first, in the 60s, the first, um, yes, I'm from previous century, <laughs> um, when um, we had the first um, cheese and uh, charcuterie packed in plastic that my dad said, oh my god, this cannot be good, we will get all the plastics in our body. But in the end, all our preservation and all our hygiene rules in food just count on good packaging in plastic. But at that moment, they said, yes, we will see, probably it will not be, and most probably it will not cause anything harm. But plastic, uh, single-use plastic products, they use pollution and litter, microplastic uh, contamination, marine ecosystem damage, uh, waste management challenges. So if we would have elaborated this from the beginning in a lot of detail with all the negative impacts, maybe policies could have avoided the exponential use of this. Um, and then we come back to this one. What do you think happened here? How did, did this car, uh, I, I think it was in the Netherlands, it was from a, from a tweet uh, I think the first month that uh, you could post photos on Twitter. What do you think happened? What could, what could have caused uh, this car to get there? Navigation system. Navigation system. Yes. It could be photoshopped, yes, indeed, the social media oh, thing. <laughs> a promo stunt, it could have been drunk and so on, but it was indeed a navigation system, and the guy wrote on his um, insurance form that um, it was caused by his tom, tom full stop. So it was not his responsibility. Who you think can be responsible for it? The driver? The driver said, no, I'm not responsible for it. 
policymakers could be responsible because they allow the use of the navigation and so on. But what I wanted to illustrate here is that uh, the soft impact. Soft impact is how we change our attitudes, our behavior due to a technology. So here it's over-reliance on GPS navigation. And uh, so over-relied that you have really you don't think anymore like you should. So it's a lack of, um, it's a detachment from the environment, reduced spatial awareness and so on. So there are a lot of things which follow due to the GPS navigation, but they are not caused by the GPS navigation. It's caused by using a technology. And soft impacts are especially the use of a technology. For instance, uh, the, the first and last thing that a lot of us do is check our, our smartphone on uh, the last emails that came in or the last news and so on, or um, the social media. So there are a lot of things that we do which are not caused by the technology, but we do them with the technologies. And these are soft impacts. There is no causal relation. I mean, the, maybe they wanted it, but uh, the people like um, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, I don't think that they did all these developments with the idea now we will make people tired because they will let their sleep because they can work over the night addicted to their devices now. So it's the way we use technologies, and this is soft impact. Um, and then the last thing about foresight is about participatory process. We already spoke about stakeholders analysis with the case of drones and um, what else we had here, uh, the electrification of cars and so on. So a stakeholders analysis, um, you can identify stakeholder groups and um, you can try to collect some people together in a room for a meeting for a brainstorming on hopes and fears related to a technology. Um, but you can also um, use them in another way. You can send them surveys and do a one one way. When you bring them together, you have really an interdisciplinary and inclusive discussions, and that's a very interesting. This or, but I think I have this in another slide. Yes, that you have um, engaged them via conversations, and in these conversations, we don't speak about discussions, but about conversations. Everyone listens to the hopes and fears of everyone related, for instance, to the drones, and everything what people feel is just noted very neutrally. And this helps a lot to give input for policy choices. Um, Cobra effect, does anyone know what it is? Uh, it's from the time that uh, UK, that Britain uh, ruled over India when the officials, the English officials saw in New Delhi that there were so many people um, dying from a cobra bite. So they said, yes, we will solve this. Um, we will ask, and it's a bit similar to the sparrows. Everyone who brings a dead cobra, we give, uh, we give a bit of money. What do you think happens? They begin breeding cobras. Next. Sorry? More mice and rats. Yeah, but this was not what happened. So the officials discovered that people were breeding the cobras. What, do you, what would you do as an official when you see such a thing? You cancel the bounty. You cancel the bounty. And what happens when you cancel the bounty? Yes, all the entrepreneuring, all the entrepreneuring uh, cobra breeders let them free because they are nothing worth anymore. So the problem became worse than before. But this term is used when you solve, when you think you solve a problem, and you make it worse, and you use even money for it. So this is uh, what's called the cobra effect. So this is something you really have to be aware 
And this you can do with your futures wheel. You can also discover with your futures wheel. You put giving a bounty for put that cobra in the middle, and you see what happens. And you, in in half an hour, <laughs> you know that you will not do this. So you can prevent a lot of perverse effects from policy by doing uh, this futures wheel exercise. No, not everything that is decided is wrong, but in this case, this is something you could, if you analyze it from the beginning, instead of saying, I have a great idea, let's put it in a policy to be sure that you check if it's indeed uh, a good idea, indeed. Yeah. And then what you do after this, and this was a bit announced in, <laughs> in the very first slide, I mean in the announcement of this event, is uh, what you do with outcomes of um, all this work. So what I explained now was um, ways to uh, think in a foresight um, approach about technological issues. Um, when you do this, you, in the end, you have a lot of evidence from all disciplines. You have a lot of views on a topic, on things that can go wrong, on possible biases, on possible blind spot, and on uh, hopes and fears of people on societal context. And from this, you can build extreme scenarios. Because what happens in the future, we do not know. What you can do with scenarios is you can try to make a, a dream story and to make a disaster story and something like um, what if this, f you, you can have the incremental changing things, but um, all what you did in such a foresight study can help to build um, scenarios. And I discovered by working with ChatGPT that ChatGPT is great in writing out short scenarios when you give some input about things that might happen. And then when you analyze, so that's scenario development, you need all this work to do this. And then you explore scenarios and you see um, what could be a future, for instance, a distant future 20 years from now. And uh, you can then see how you can reach a desirable future, how you can avoid a future which you really do not want, but also how um, a future, for instance, the, um, the rising um, sea level, can we live with it? How can we think about living in a world with a higher sea level? You can just overcome the, the fear and just think about new constraints. So it can help really to do a strategic planning to avoiding something, to reaching something, and so on. And so, and this is then a strategic foresight. So a scenario is a way, scenarios are a way to rehearse possible future. That you just imagine yourself in certain futures. There are a lot of um, um, science fiction books which help, like 1984, there it's done. Um, the movie Contagion, anyone has seen this? about pandemic, so this was, uh, this movie is from 2010, and it depicts a world with a pandemic very, very similar to COVID, which, and uh, it was very evidence-based, so a scenario should be analyzed with all the evidence we have, and that was very evidence-based, and when I saw it, we had a big discussion, and I think in all the countries, about um, the priority for the vaccination. In this movie, they said, they concluded, let's vaccinate everyone on their birthday, and in one year, everyone got a vaccine. Just that this science fiction mode, if we really put ourselves in a science fiction mode, in storytelling and so on, but you really have to focus on this, and then you really can already um, prepare a lot of things for the case a pandemic happens. Um, so to be prepared on possible future. And that's then um, what's done after the, that's part of the foresight exercise, but is then different. And then who read the book, A Brave New World? Oh, many, okay. 
So um, Huxley wrote his book in 1932, and he focused a lot on human genetics, so that we could um, make people like we wanted them. But um, he also made a follow-up of this in 1959, where he, which he called, it's a small, uh, a smaller book. Um, it's available on the web in PDF. The Brave New World Revisited. Because he saw so many things changing, so many technologies coming up already in the 50s. And he emphasized the need for educating critical thinking. Um, because in such a technology-driven society, people probably don't learn anymore to think critically because they get everything from the media. It was uh, basically, his biggest worry was the radio and television especially television. He said people just get everything they don't have to think anymore. Um, and um, it's indeed... So what, what he concluded was without critical thinking skills, uh, we will become passive consumers of information. And he just assumed in a very pessimistic way that um, education would completely um, go down to a terrible level. He said people will be easily manipulatable and uh, if this is a word, and um, they will lack the ability to, to make a distinction between what's true and what's false. Um, I come back on this. Um, so we started from responsible technology governance. And first thing is to complement traditional evidence, um, first of all, with evidence from other disciplines about the same topic, but also with qualitative information about societal context, the so hopes and fears of stakeholders. And therefore, the foresight approach helps us by doing a systemic approach, so looking in a holistic way to a topic, um, to check with a 360 degree view, like with a steep wheel, to be aware of biases of ourselves in the first place and of stakeholders, and also checking the key assumptions, which are very important in how a situation develops, and considering possible impacts, um, such as easily done with the future suite. And to do all this inclusive and participatory, so if you involve stakeholders, you really have to put them together and to let them discuss together, and uh, to do everything in an interdisciplinary way. So that's about uh, responsible or foresight for responsible um, technology government. So I repeat, it's not for predicting the future, but for being prepared for what might happen, for minimizing surprises, and for uh, preventing uh, decisions with an impact uh, which you do not want. And um, I would like to do a call for action, because this uh, Huxley um, book revisited um, that we really need to be aware of cultivating critical thinking uh, abilities um, at schools, in education. Um, and then also, of course, that um, everyone who is dealing with... But that foresight-based thinking is also cultivated. Uh, we all had lessons in history. No one of us, more, almost no one, had lessons about the future. So, but future, to think about the future, I think, is of a similar importance as to think about the past. And this is something uh, which is done in some countries, like in Singapore, uh, in Canada also. Uh, there is a lot done on foresight, like a, a daily, normal thing, but it's, um, this is something which can be further developed. And that it means um, considering systemic views, holistic views, understanding broader picture, 360-degree view, and so on, um, but that you really cultivate that people simply use certain steps when making um, an analysis of a problem. Um, so it's all depending on critical thinking skills, which um, we should continue to teach to the young. So this is what I wanted to discuss. I went a bit over time, maybe, but there is still time yes, for... Thank you so much. Discussion.
I just want to say thank you so much for the insightful uh, lecture. I mean, like the title of the topic was Navigating the Future, and I think we realized how complicated that might be, the necessity for a systematic approach, how this can be carried out uh, in uh, a very systematic and structured way. So we'd like to open now the floor for questions. Uh, if you have any, we have some time left. Thank you. If you can say who you are, where you're from. Hi, thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I'm Melanie Smallman from UCL. I used to work in the UK government, but I now am um, an academic in science and technology studies. So I kind of study the sociology and politics of science. But I'm in a department with historians, so I'm acutely aware of your last point about learning things from the past. And I think two, two things from science and technology studies that really struck me about your talk. I mean, I think this argument that the future is unpredictable and that um, technologies have dual use and are unpredictable, they're quite well-trodden arguments which come from the tech industry. But actually, if we look at how technology plays out in the real world, they're not that unpredictable. They fall along very predictable paths and, you know, already the first uses of AI and advanced technologies are leaving the poorest with the worst effects. So I'm kind of interested to know how do you make use of real-world evidence and historical precedents in trying to be a bit more empowered than just saying, oh, we don't know um, what's going to happen, that they're completely unpredictable? And secondly, the other thing from science and technology studies that we do know is that the way that technologies play out in the real world is profoundly shaped by... Um, expectations and aspirations of how we believe the world should be. So how the world is and how it should be are intermingled. So how do you reflect on your role in predicting the future in actually shaping the future as well? Two questions, sorry. Uh, thank you. I thank don't you. have anything to write here. Uh, but the first question was about um, taking into account what we know from the past. Yeah. Um, uh, this can already be. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, this can already be um, taken into account a lot by uh, collecting evidence from multiple disciplines, and with multiple disciplines, I of course also include history. Um, when we had a small, uh, only a small team for foresight in the European Parliament, we had two historians and uh, a sociologist uh, specialized in science and technology. So the, the evidence that we can collect from all the, the different disciplines than the technology already give a lot of information about what can happen. And the second part of your question was... Um, so, I already said we don't predict the future, but um, for uh, shaping the future, um, uh, there are different ways of shaping the future. So, you can uh, have normative scenarios, for instance, like the Green Deal, it's one single scenario. And then you see how we get there. So, you say, voila, the future is that we are climate neutral in Europe in uh, 2050, and we have intermediate um, parameters in 2030 and then they calculate back on what we need like in 2025 we need like 25,000 charging stations uh, 25 million I don't know anymore anyway but there are a lot of calculations of what we need to have at certain milestones um, for a desirable future, it's quite easy to make a planning, but a strategic planning should not be just we reach this at that point in time, like 30, 50 years from now, but with a strategic planning of what you do with milestones, but also how much it costs and what you need to do for it. And then you detail your planning. So then you really can uh, shape the future. But you have to calculate back. You have to know what every step costs, what you need as resources and so on. And it's not yet a practice which is uh, used a lot. Finland has quite some practices. Uh, Singapore, uh, Canada, Hawaii also, for one or the other reason. 
but it's really something which should be, yeah, as I said, cultivated to systematically do to have a more serious uh, planning for policy goals. Thank you. I'm going to take two questions. Who wants to ask one? Okay. Three, four, five. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Lisa Morano, uh, Intercultural Communication at Radboud University. And I was wondering at the European Union, how do you deal with uh, different expectations from different cultures, for example, about meat? Uh, what would be a future without meat in France or Italy is not the same as in the Netherlands. Another question? Hello, I'm Julie Anderson. I work for the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, what we call today an impact investor. And for each investment project, we have each project being reviewed by a very a varied set of departments, which represent very different views along the lines that you presented, environmental and social, economic impact, development impact, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, what I observe is that the impact or the impact assessment is very much dependent on the assessor himself of course, their biases, etc. But there's a point at which you just cannot multiply the, the number of people um, that will assess a project, so you're a bit subject to their own depth, to put it simply. One solution is to institutionalize their review by setting very clear guidelines as to what they should be looking for, but then it, of course, makes it quite static um, in a fast-moving world. This is not really what you want. So how would you solve this tension? Uh, yes, do we take a third question too there? Uh, and then I see what... Uh, hi, my name is Julie Lintors. I am pursuing a PhD uh, at UVA on how organizations are actually preparing for the future. So what they, are they doing? And I'm interested if you have any experience and why they're actually not really preparing for the future. So, because okay. this came from the we... uh, World Economic Forum, that uh, a lot of organizations are actually not really preparing. Um, let me start with uh, the first question on expectations. Um, so, this is exactly what you do when you um, organize strategic conversations. You try to understand, we did, for instance, I have run a project on um, gene editing where uh, there are a lot of differences between geographical areas, like, for instance, in Austria, there is no a gene, uh, genetic modification. Gen GMOs are not allowed at all, uh, or were not at that moment. And in other countries, it's more usual. Plus, the stakeholders also have different views, like, um, it was very interesting to see viewpoints from organizations. So we had involved like uh, organic farmers associations, even a vegetarian um, organization in Europe, um, but also researchers, scientists, uh, traditional farmers, uh, NGOs, uh, activist organizations, and so on. So, um, and there we saw a lot of, we, we got a big insight in why they are pro or con. And um, if a country, if one country has a lot of uh, opposition against a certain technology and another has, it's very interesting to hear how they explain it, but Europe can make distinctions. Like in a project on precision agriculture, we made the overview of possible measures which are suitable for the different countries. And then, uh, for instance, um, I, I will stand up because otherwise I don't see you. Well. Um, for the case of agriculture, we also made an overview, and this, of course, is how detailed you make your evidence. So your real scientific report based upon the evidence from the past till today. So the very first slide till the middle. Uh, we made an overview of business structures which were different in the different countries. And then we saw, for instance, in Romania that they had 73% of the families had their main income from agriculture, while in the Netherlands at that moment it was 35 and in Flanders it was 2%. So you see that there is a completely different 
um, structure of businesses of culture on dealing with agricultural techniques. And we had a very interesting discussion with members of the parliament on how different measures, different applications of precision agriculture could have um, a different priority in implementing in different countries so that the common agriculture policy had to keep this flexibility of um, technologies, for instance, the technology for um, replacing workers' labor in agriculture was not needed in Eastern European countries, but could be very helpful in the Netherlands and Belgium. So that this had to be taken into account. This was the advice in the common agriculture policy, if this answers a bit this question. And then uh, Julie's question. Um, so the, um, what we do is we in the parliament, um, we uh, give trainings with guidelines on foresight-based policy analysis, where um, if you have a harmonized way of making such an impact assessment, because impact assessment is very closely related to foresight. Um, if everyone uses the same steps in a methodology, uh, it's much less colored from their own role, from their own biases. And I think even if you don't have the, um, the resources to put more people on an impact assessment, um, of course, the ideal is that different people are involved. But if you have a, a harmonized way of working, you have much more, you have a much higher quality and a much more neutrality in your impact assessments. So this can, this can help. Uh, we used to give, yes, you didn't tell that I retired because of my age. I retired at the parliament, but I'm still um, doing some work like uh, talking a lot and so on. But um, in the European Parliament, we gave a lot of trainings, not only for the European Parliament, but also for other organizations like the, the ESC, um, for the members, for the, the colleagues, uh, the staff, but also for the liaison groups, which was stakeholders. So it's a question of just giving this, this, these short trainings. Like here, it's not much more. I mean, usually it's up to three hours or so. But that they get the basics and that they also get guidelines with some steps to follow. Uh, and then the last question, I didn't write down your name, for organizations. <laughs> also, Julie. Uh, for organizations using foresight, there's a very interesting piece of history with Shell the Dutch uh, oil company, the Dutch Royal Oil Company, Shell. So they started, basically they are the pioneers of foresight and it's um, a very fascinating story because at the end of the 60s, they um, had someone who was a friend of uh, one of the top guys and he was a social scientist and they, I invited him to be part of the general board of management. And uh, first meeting, this guy asked, yes, but how do you do your strategic management in Shell? And they said, oh, it's very easy. We have our Excel sheets over the years with demand and supply. And he said, yes, but this is only extrapolation. So I mean something else. And um, he asked for an interdisciplinary team that he could choose, so an ad hoc team, to prepare strategic management in Shell. And what he did is, by the next year, he developed a series of seven questions, which were asked to be uh, treated in a report, so seven tasks basically for every board, so um, North America, South America, Asia, Africa and Europe to solve. And these were what if questions, so like we just had seen what if um, we don't need cows for our beef. These what if questions was, um, there was one which was what if the OPEC countries close the tap. In October 71 it was, they closed the tap with a short Arab war. 
And each of the regions had a plan because this was, had been their management task to prepare for hypothetical what-ifs. And one of these was exactly what happened and they were so well prepared that they jumped from the 15th or 16th place to the second. So this is just a way, if you really imagine and you take the time to imagine a certain future, even if you think it will not happen, but you just do it and you do it um, with a certain level of fun, then you are also very creative and they developed a way to act immediately when this happened. So this worked. And this is also the reason why a lot of foresighters are Dutch speaking, because many of them used to work in Shell. Thank you so much for the answer. I think we're now out of time. Thank you all. Um, it has been, as I said, a very insightful, uh, a very insightful lecture. Maybe you know we can talk more if people have further questions. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.